Filip Kozlowski. I'm the CEO of Leading Edge Materials, Canadian public uh, company. We're listed on the Venture Exchange on the OTC markets. We also have a dual listing on the Nasdaq First North Exchange in Stockholm. I'm based in Stockholm as the CEO. Um, we have a very sharp strategy uh, on critical raw materials, but also focusing on the European Union. So we have three projects targeting battery materials, energy transition materials, critical raw materials. Uh, two of those projects are in Sweden. We got a graphite mine where we're developing a mine to anode material uh, strategy. Uh, the graphite mine is one of few built and permanent graphite mines in the Western world. Uh, it's been on care and maintenance while we're developing the downstream process. Um, the other project in Sweden is the Norra Kjär heavy rare earth element project. It's, uh, it's one of the world's most significant heavy rare earth element deposits. We've been developing that since the late 2000s. Uh, it's, um, it's a significant deposit both in size and in the grade of the heavy rare earth element. Uh, recently, we were granted an exploration license for a third project in Romania. So we're still within the European Union, but we have to go to Romania to find something that has potential uh, for high grade nickel and cobalt discoveries within Europe. So very much looking forward to start exploration on that point. Brilliant. Philippe, thanks uh, very much for joining us today. So um, it's a new story, um, definitely topical one in terms of um, critical raw materials and, and in Europe too. So hopefully we might learn a uh, thing or two about what's going on over there. Um, and what's your background? What's your story? So I come from a financial industry background. Um, I, I, I started at a, a large investment bank in London trading equities moved over back to Stockholm, uh, traded my own portfolio money, um, then moved over to uh, working for a family office uh, down in Europe for two years as an investment manager. And uh, when I moved back to Stockholm, I started working as a portfolio manager for a macro hedge fund focusing on option strategies. I, you know, I was in touch with this uh, company, uh, Leading Edge Materials, and they were looking for a non-executive director to manage their local presence, uh, cover financial strategy and investor relations with the base out of Sweden. And that's really, you know, that, that was my first uh, first steps into the junior mining space. And uh, I was quite hooked immediately and I've been gradually been dragged further into the company on the project development side. In parallel, me joining, there were a lot of initiatives that were launched uh, in Brussels on, on the policy arena, so the European Battery Alliance. Uh, European Raw Materials Alliance, and I started uh, you know, managing our presence in those forums, which are you know, uh, maybe not something you can reap the benefits from in the short term, but if you look forward into the future and we come to project financing and how do you sort of get the most support for the project at that stage, you know, these forums are going to be very important. So, you know, it, it's been a gradual step uh, further into the space of junior mining companies, uh, battery raw materials, rare earth elements, to the point in 2020 when, when there was a change in the company uh, with um, looking to establish a more efficient management structure where in the past we had our headquarters in Vancouver, uh, board of directors and management living in Australia, but uh, then having two development stage projects in Sweden. Uh, it's not the best uh, and efficient way to develop projects. So we were looking to find a more efficient structure and uh, the board of directors were changed. Uh, we managed to attract a very senior and experienced board of directors. We got Lars-Erik Johansson as the chairman, having resigned from Ivanhoe the, the year before. Uh, remembers one of our projects from the 90s when Bo Liden held the Norra Kjær project. We'll get into more detail on that later. Uh, and saw our small company as an opportunity where he could actually make uh, make an impact on revitalizing the Swedish uh, mining industry, which has been in a downturn for a long time due to permitting issues. Now we've seen the sentiment and, and, and the environment for permitting change over the last year. Uh, so that's his perspective. We've got Daniel as a director who's the CEO of Govex uh, Uranium. I think you've spoken with him a few times. Uh, and um, you know, not that usual in this uh, world of junior mining companies, we got the largest shareholder on the board of directors uh, who owns more than a third of the shares, uh, who is actively looking after his investment you know, for the best interest of every shareholder, really. So with myself being a Swedish citizen based out of Stockholm, we got Lars-Erik, Eric, both Swedish citizens, uh, and Daniel, not the European Union citizen anymore, but at least in a close time zone. So. 
uh, we're, we're becoming very much a European company. Uh, that being said, we haven't left our legacy uh, Canadian corporate structure. We're, we're balancing around 50-50% shareholder base in North America and in Europe. Uh, whereas some of the trends that we see on the industrial side with regionalization, uh, I would say we're seeing some of the same uh, shifts in sentiment from the investor community as well, where you read in the newspaper about the growth in electric vehicles, you want to get exposure to the battery raw materials that are going to be needed for that electric vehicle uh, growth. Uh, and then you hear the politicians talk about, we want to support mining projects in our region to build out the project. And naturally, you will be looking for stocks that have projects in your region. So that, that's one of the reasons why we've seen an increased interest from the Swedish and European uh, shareholder base. Okay, look, I appreciate that, that background. There's a few touch points in there um, that we, we kind of maybe need to get um, into. Um, but let me start with the stuff that I, I, I want to understand, right? So you're, as you say, the markets have come off for you and, and, and a lot of people at, um, in the last three months uh, across the borders that's kind of risk off, um, people like holding cash. Um, but you are... Depending on the time of week, I get you a know, forty to fifty thousand, a uh, forty forty to fifty million dollar Canadian company at the moment. You've got multiple projects, all all in Europe, right? Um, I need to understand what I what I need to be looking at, and 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 to to do that, I need to understand what the what the business plan is here, because you've got a bunch of blue chip names you've thrown in there. The um the the, the board and management hold a significant part of this company. You know, it's, it's just shy of fifty percent of the company. I need to understand how you intend to navigate your path forward and what I should be looking at. So maybe do you, maybe is it worth talking about some of the projects and how you're kind of why you've constructed them like that. So the, the result of having a rare earth project, let's start you know, with, with the background, uh, and, the, and the graphite project comes back to 2016 through a merger of two companies. Uh, and then we bolted on the nickel and cobalt uh, project. As a strategy, when the, the new board of directors and myself came on, uh, and at that time, the market cap was a tenth of what you mentioned. So uh, it was pretty much a turnaround story, uh, just at the low of of there was zero interest for rare earth elements or battery raw materials. We looked at this portfolio project. We also had the lithium exploration project in Sweden. So we had four projects. We saw were significantly undervalued compared with the potential and what we were seeing on the fundamental driver side as well from, from, from the demand side, you know, every auto manufacturer announcing they're going full electric, etc. So it's, you know, we went through an exercise look, you know, what do we do to unlock the value? So for the graphite project where um, it was originally was targeted to produce flake graphite concentrate, but in 2016 it, there was a shift moving towards, you know, what downstream process do we need to to develop uh, anode material production? And the, the economics around that had never really been demonstrated. So the first thing that we did was to launch a, a scoping study, a preliminary economic assessment on the vertically integrated mine to anode material. Uh, we we announced that last year, and it's you know it, it's a fantastic looking project in the sense that uh, 270 uh, post 248 post tax MPV IRR 37 percent, uh, and and uh, you know a long life of mine for that project as well. So we demonstrated what the value is for that project, and then you know the next step now is how do we. Uh, de-risk the project uh, from the technical side. So we're working on, we've always done the development work on a very small lab scale using external laboratories. Uh, over the last six months, we've gone forward with doing larger uh, size trials uh, where we use our equipment suppliers for uh, testing the process. Uh, and we're in the middle of that process. Uh, and then, uh, in the, so, we're, we're very much focused on the downstream of the anode material. So we've got a quite unique approach to uh, some of the other companies that you might have spoken with on that are developing anode processes. Uh, everyone wants to get away from HF purification that China does, right? Uh, so everyone's looking at uh, carbon chlorination, caustic ro roasting, uh, improved chemical leaching processes, whereas we've gone for a full thermal purification process which has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, for us, the disadvantages are not that much valid. Uh, the disadvantages are it's a very energy intensive process, so you need low cost of electricity. We're located in the northern half of Sweden, where you got an abundance of hydropower and a significant build out of wind power. 
So when you read about the electricity crisis, the energy crisis in Europe and sort of globally over the last year, uh, we've been paying two, two and a half key, uh, euro cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, so that, you know, on the OPEC side, it makes sense for us. And then the additional effect is the environmental cost of being a very energy intensive. If you don't have the right electricity mix, you're going to have a high carbon footprint. We don't have that problem as well, which we've demonstrated through the life cycle assessment. Um, so we're developing that process. We also announced last year that we're looking to establish a 50-50 joint venture on the, on the downstream uh, with an Australian company. So we come from the, you know, the black side, as I say, which is the mining, the materials processing, uh, graphite being a quite black material. And then these Australians, they come from the white side being, you know, they have a technology that's been developed within the laboratories of a university where they did the technology transfer to a private company, which got funded by venture capital. And they have the IP around silicon graphite composite materials. And we meet somewhere in the middle where we're looking to link together our, uh, our know-how, you know, upstream within our bubble and so sort of their IP and know-how on the downstream. So they're very much involved in coming back to what I said, the bulk trials that we do now. We've tested our side on 15 kilos of material, which is bulk in our case. Uh, that material is now on its way to Australia uh, for them to finalize the products that we would potentially be producing because they have a pilot plant commission down there. Uh, to that material, we'll put into battery cells, we'll do internal testing, external testing, send out a few pre-qualification samples to potential customers in Europe. And based on the results of that, we'll sort of form the basis for moving forward with incorporating the joint venture and moving towards a demonstration plant on a 500 ton per annum scale. Right, so let's let's stick with this, okay? We'll come, come to the other two projects in a second, right? So this is, you know, again, what we see is people coming coming into this space and say, well, let, let, we're, we're going to insert ourselves into the battery thematic, the EV thematic, um, throw a bunch of buzzwords around vertical integration, et cetera, without necessarily having the, the know-how. With, with Sakona um, battery technologies in Australia, you, you, you announced a um, proposed joint venture. So it's not yet solidified. Um, can you tell me about what, what, they, what we should expect of that JV, because um, you, you said they've got a pilot plant, but you would that would not be part of the the, the JV. You, you'd build your own, or you'd you'd build a larger pilot plant. I mean, what what does that JV look like, and what's it, and what's it going to cost um, you? And what you know, what's your share of this in terms of the downstream component over and above the PA it's you right. released it's last it's year? It's so, do you know what I mean? I'm I'm, tr I'm trying to go. What's the mine worth? PA says it's you know NPV of around 250 million uh, US, right? But if you're going to try and capture some of the downstream, what, what, you know, what do you get from that? What do your shareholders benefit from? So so it's a bit difficult because the PA is looking for our own vertically integrated production. Exactly, plant. exactly. So where it still has some. So we used Sikona's coating technology as a licensed technology for the for the scoping study. So, you know, you got the four stages, remind people, the four stages of bringing a flake graphite concentrate to, a, uh, to an active animal material. You got uh, sizing, shaping, purification, and coating. Uh, the coating one being you know, probably the most difficult one and the most entrenched in Asia. So with uh, in terms of how the economics around the joint venture looks, uh, we don't have a technical report to support that. I can talk about something that is fairly similar, which is our own vertically integrated, which demonstrate 7,500 tons per year of active annual material production, uh, capex 110 million uh, US uh, for that project. And, and, and the bulk of that 110 is on the offsite anode material factory. So you get, you know, we have those numbers, which gives an indication of what our 50% split would be on the joint venture, right? um, where it becomes more complicated. One of the strategic reasons we decided to uh, go forward with the joint venture discussion, right? New investors will question yourself: if you have this, if you have this amazing opportunity, why would you go and share it with someone? Uh, we've always faced the challenge: if we're successful with commercializing our material you know, the full line down to active anode materials. If we can sell 7,500 tons per year of active anode material, we would be able to sell 75,000 tons of material per year because the expected demand in Europe alone by 2030 is 1 million tons plus of anode material. 
so how do we scale up or how do we scale out our opportunity? And that's really where Sikona fits very well as, uh, as well, where they have the silicon composite technology, right? Sikno silicon technology composite means that they've agnostically tested their silicon compositing technology with various feedstocks, natural graphite from various sources, synthetic graphite from various sources, natural and synthetic graphite uh, from various sources and their silicon composite. So that gives us an opportunity to consider, do we produce a natural graphite coated spherical graphite or do we actually produce a blended product? So our 7,500 tons plus sourcing 7,500 tons per year of synthetic graphite producing a drop in uh, active and material product because everyone wants a blended product. Uh, so th that, that, that's uh, complicated. It's an opportunity that complicates things a bit further in understanding the, the investment case. Yeah, well, that's what I'm trying to get at. Because if you if you look at how you're being valued today versus just this project alone, just this project alone, it, it seems that the market doesn't understand what's going on. Let alone the other two projects as well. We lay that on top. It's like well, the market's not quite sure of what they they should be buying into. Um, here, so and if you look at the graphite market, obviously Chinese, but you know big, big leaders there, um, you know technically and also in terms of the the the, the production um, and and use of of of, of um, these materials. What were the options available to you? I, mean, I know you you've proposed uh, Sakona battery technologies, JV, etc. But are there many options out there for you in terms but, of I'll other groups that you could be talking to? About, uh, I'll give you an example how to think about the joint venture app. Rather than us giving away 50% of the opportunity, the opportunity by involving Sikona is probably twice of what we originally have due to blending it with synthetic graphite. But when you look further down the line, if you start producing silicon composite anode materials, the next generation of materials that are even higher priced than only natural graphite anode materials, then you can see how the sort of one plus one becomes uh, something bigger that we're part of them. But how many companies did you um, talk to before settling on these guys? And, you know, and what's so special about these guys? So we base uh, our decisions on data and after having you know, them having reached out to us, we'd love to test your natural graphite for our silicon composite. And you know, this is how it works. If, uh, if someone wants to produce a material knowing that they will you know, source natural graphite material in the future, uh, it was quite interesting to test. And based on the data that came out of that, you know, the, the performance of our combined material is, is exceptional. And from their comments is our thermally purified material, and we didn't really stick on the thermal purification process, but we do have some benefits of the thermal purification process being you can reach higher purity levels, right? So it's a question of how long do you leave it in the, in the hot zone uh, and at what temperature, but essentially if you if you leave it long enough, it will get completely purified, but it's gonna come with the cost. So question is what do people demand? Uh, so there's a higher purity level, less impurities, less, uh, much better safety, much better performance. That in addition with the surface modification effect, which you sort of enhance with the coating, uh, are the things that we believe produce a higher performing material. So seeing the, the performance of that material uh, led us to exploring this joint venture, which is something we didn't, haven't, you know, we hadn't been looking for uh, earlier. Right. So, okay. If we wouldn't have had the joint venture, we'd probably gone down the line looking at our own coating technology or licensing the coating technology, etc., and going on it alone. Okay. What's the process you've now got to go through to put some economics on this kind of the, the downstream, the, the white? A component, um, and you know, what's, what's the what's, what's the time frame, and what's that going to cost you? So we're coming back to how we fund our company. I think last quarter we had two point four million uh, Canadian in the in the bank, uh, which uh, gives us an opportunity to fund these quite low cost development works. Obviously, when you start talking about demonstration plants, project financing is not going to be enough. We also have options and warrants, uh, a significant amount, uh, 50 million in total, that are very deep in the money. And the majority of those are held by, uh, by insiders. And as long as we see the company being undervalued compared with most of our peers, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a preferred solution to con continue to internally fund the company. Right? So I'm, I briefly touched on the next step for developing our material, where we are 
now, you know, we have our material now with Sikona. They will finalize that. The, the data on that, and we have, you know, we're attending the Stuttgart battery show together. Uh, they will visit the graphite mine. Uh, based on the, the data, we will take a decision on whether to go forward with the discussions on the incorporated joint venture. Then comes the 500 ton per year uh, demonstration plan. So that is something that we would need to do. Uh, uh, an engineering study to to evaluate the cost of building uh, one of those. And that would be in Australia? It would be located in Sweden. So absolutely Great. 100% Sweden. Good. So, we, you know, we're targeting to have sell our material, produce our material in Sweden and sell it to Europe. Brilliant. Uh, because we have those benefits of the electricity cost, uh, the low carbon footprint of the electricity cost. So we're, we're located 120 kilometers from the coast. So the coast in our part of Sweden is uh, a very industrialized region. You've got deep water ports, you've got uh, train lines, you've got a highway. Uh, we're looking to locate the, the plant. Uh, we're doing a localization study at the moment. So we're looking at some, somewhere in between the graphite mine and, and the coast. Right, so, okay, so, so there's, a lot, there's a lot going on there, busy, some decisions to be made, and you know, we, we understand the finances a little bit more clearly. And t talk to me about Sweden, Sweden and the kind of the whole EU taxonomy around this kind of EV thematic, which is going on, this massive infrastructure being built, but you've got various countries, uh, states, um, that have their own opinions on different parts, or, or, or different bits of the, the, the moving parts, as it were. How easy is it to do business in Sweden in terms of getting support that you want? What is the ecosystem that you want to feed this your product into? What, what's the, if you can help me understand it a little bit more. If you look at from the industry perspective, the downstream, our future customers for our various materials, Europe has been in the forefront. You know, we're pretty much, you know, after Korea and Japan, we've been so sort of very rapidly establishing our own energy transition, uh, so the new base industries of this world. So I think one very good example is Northvolt, which is you know now the first producing gigafactory in Europe. In 2016, it was an idea on paper. Now they have a planned 60 gigawatt hour factory in northern Sweden. They're planning another 50 gigawatt hour factory in southern Sweden and, and, and a factory in Germany. So uh, I think Europe has been very successful in attracting the, the downstream part of the value chains. And you've seen how the various uh, European automakers have jumped on the bandwagon as well, going, you know, uh, Shifting their uh, their product range to electrified vehicles, and you know, looking at heavy vehicles as well. Scania recently announced that they're you know they're launching a, a long range uh, heavyweight uh, load truck as well. So all of that is happening. Where you know the realization is that uh, one has to remember the the perspective of the European Union is the green trans green transition. You know, our climate is important, but there's a number of other factors that are in play here, where uh, Europe, the competitiveness of European industry is at risk. Right? So when you see everything happening in China with uh, battery production, Chinese electric vehicles starting to drive around the road uh, in, in Europe, in Sweden, uh, Tesla Model 3s that were produced in China are now being sold in Europe. There's a significant threat against the base industry of Europe. So uh, this is a Supporting the development of full value chains within Europe is a, to some extent, a protectionist measure as well to save European jobs. Uh, and then the sort of the bigger fundamental question about geopolitical risk, where how resilient are our value chains? And you know, it's much more common to talk about the U.S. Army is dependent on China, but uh, you know, the same applies to the European uh, armies, where you know we are dependent on the raw materials. And I think all of this got got a shot of adrenaline where uh, after the pandemic, where we realized, you know, we can't buy face masks because they're all produced in China. You can't buy uh, simple painkillers because they're all produced in China. So uh, I think all of these things are, and, and more lately with the Chips Act, so uh, semiconductors, uh, the the theme of deglobalization is, is real. You know, we're moving away from a globalized world where you have the added effect of supply chain disruptions. It's not about do I want to pay an, a high price for material that I need? Can I even get that material that I need? So everything's get, everything is getting regionalized uh, and the European political arena is very supportive of that. And then, as you mentioned, European Union member states, I think on a member state level, all are supportive of this. There's not a member state that is against it. 
But in each member state, there will be some concerns around, do we want to support mining in Europe? And, and that sort of feeds up on an aggregate level in Europe as well. Is, is that narrative still running in, in terms of the, um, well, there's a perception that Europe is like slightly anti-mining. We've seen it in Spain, we've seen it in, in Portugal, um, you know, and, 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 and other places where it's like, not in my backyard is the, is the, is the phrase. Is, is, there an under, is there a view that governments need to kind of get behind this uh, and maybe help change that, that narrative um, a little bit? I mean, are, are you going to come up any, against any roadblocks, is, is I guess what I'm asking? No, and I think it's, um, it's important to remember that the governments are already trying to change the narrative. And uh, it's also very important to remember that the narrative is not the majority consensus. It's a very loud, small part of the populace that gets heard and actually does get uh, influenced. So if, if you look what the consensus is, you know, everyone supports it. And especially now, the narrative has obviously changed with the energy crisis. When people start seeing their electricity bills and, you know, vision that even further out in time, if people start losing their jobs because there wasn't enough raw material supply from Europe, obviously everyone is going to be very supportive of, of more raw material supply from Europe. The problem becomes when you have the not in my backyard. So, you know, uh, a problem that we we're not seeing only with uh, with mining. We're seeing it with wind power as well. No one wants to have you know have a view ruined by a wind power. I actually think wind power turbines look very nice because it's a bit futuristic in the sense. But uh, you have that. Uh, you know, people don't want to change the way they've lived, uh, not realizing that they're part of a bigger world that is changing. So. Yeah, you can't have electrification without the materials, and those materials are predominantly underground. Um, right? Okay. Well, I think I think that's kind of, that's kind of an interesting viewpoint from from you. you know, in terms of um, how you you, I mean, you're you're in Sweden. How do you insert yourself into that ecosystem? Are there we, we've we've um, talked about the European Battery Alliance and, and, and groups like that? Obviously, you know, plowing a furrow, um, you know for companies like yourself in, in country, but is that going to give you access to any, any kind of funding or, um, you know, grants or, you know, so, so, so any kind of like tax advantages going forward? Because, you know, every, everything counts at this stage for a company like you, but what's the reality in terms of act, accessing help like that financially? You, you mentioned European battery lines. I would say the more relevant form is the European Raw Materials Alliance, which okay. sort of, uh, takes on the baton from uh, from the European battery lines that were, was very successful on developing, supporting the development of the downstream, but really didn't make any significant progress on the upstream. So whereas the European Raw Materials Alliance now completely focuses on the raw material supply chain, and you know the first uh, the first group out of that raw materials alliance is for permanent magnets and rare earth elements, and there's going to be energy storage materials as well, and there's going to be you know every raw material is becoming critical in this world we live in. So uh, there, there's been quite clear communication of what the ambitions are, you know, coming back to the discussion on the narrative, you know, one, raising the awareness and the acceptance of this. So you take a European Union body of, uh, that can sort of send a clear message why this is something that we need to do and why, there's, why it's something that we shouldn't be afraid of doing as well. Uh, obviously the financing yeah. gap for raw material companies has been identified as a serious bottleneck as well, where there's an uncompetitive playing field compared with China, which gets state subsidies on, on various le levels. Uh, so that, you know, the concrete example, there's going to be a, a public fund launched, it's called the Raw Materials Bridge Fund. Uh, I think it's expected to launch by the end of this year with uh, 150 to 200 million euros per year to bring uh, raw material projects from so exploration, scoping, study stage to feasibility stage, where you hand over the project to your more average, uh, your, your more standard financing vehicles. So, you know, the banks are very open to funding projects like ours. They say, come with the come with the feasibility study, and we'll fund it. Uh, not understanding that there are added, you know, additional layers of risk for niche materials like battery raw materials and rare earth element, whether it's political risk, market risk, technical risk is an important one. So yeah, the European politicians have accepted that we need to de-risk these projects in order for them to get funded and get into production. Interesting, okay. And do you think, 
I mean, we, we look at, we always talk about China more broadly, Asia being quite um, supportive of those industries and, and capital being available. Whereas Europe and relations is like, say, the, the US, which you, you count as, you know, an adversary, but also, you know, an, an, an accomplice in a way. They, in fact, we're going to have to support each other. Those ecosystems are going to have to support each other. Ex China is going to have to wor work out the, you know, the, the, the flow of minerals and metals. Um, but is there much conversation between between the two, or is, or is Europe, you know, working in isolation in that sense? No, very much cooperation, and you know, Europe has a, uh, has different strategies. One strategy is being develop more projects within within our border, which in the end is going to be if you need a secure solution, that is going to be the one. Uh, they are doing trade negotiations, uh, collaborations with Canada, for example, uh, countries in Africa, etc. Uh, those are good, you know, it, it complements the European supply, but you can't really rely on that 100%. And I think in the end, it's going to come down to the demand pool. Right? So if uh, it's very good if you have a corporation to potentially source raw materials from Canada uh, in the future. But what if that material uh, makes more sense to supply the Canadian industry? And it's going to be more competitive, cost competitive to sell it within your region. So, you know, coming back to the regionalization, I think, yeah, you can have collaborations, but the flows are getting sort of disconnected to your local region. Okay, and and, and I guess um, except for, you know, obviously your your nickel cobalt project uh, exploration project in, in Romania um, aside, both heavy rare earths and graphite are very very technical. Um, but there's also not a lot of players ex China in, in, in both of those. Um, so they have ex extreme risk in, in in that sense. But are you seeing? Um, with all of these, you know, uh, critical minerals um, lists, which most companies are pumping out at the moment, are you seeing the support for these more technically uh, difficult and te technically limited and financially constrained projects? I would say the most support is there, identifying that there are those challenges. Uh, concrete action being, you know, there's uh, Horizon Europe, which is uh, which is a program for research grants within Europe. Uh, there is an open call for projects for developing uh, the processes for natural graphite to bring it to active animal material. And it's a 10 million euro budget to bring, bring in together consortia of, from industry, from academia, uh, and, and actually solve those problems. So you know, on, on the research stage, I think Europe has always been very efficient in funding. The, there's a gap between researching and commercializing but luckily you know we come in with uh, uh, quite quite many years behind us in, in that sense so getting that support on the last bits of unrisking the te technological risk would be great and you know this is a call that we would obviously apply for and it's hard to say whether we will win that call or not but it's something that we will try and there's very few projects that can compete for that I say so how much so much time again given where you're at at the moment obviously like and I'm, I'm not going to Talk about what, what the market's done to your, your, your share price or any anyone else's, and over the last three months, I think it's it, it would be un, unfair, and everyone's taken a, a, a beating. Um, but given the size and scale of the operation now, I mean, how much time and effort are you spending in terms of look, ha having these conversations with all of, with, with the um, the European Raw Materials Alliance and, or, or others in terms of seeking grants or any other kind of financial incentive that may be available to you? Because, you know, 2.4 million you talked about earlier is, is not a lot. You know, it sounds like you know what you want to do. It's a question of the cost of the capital to be able to do that. So is it worth you spending time Getting, chasing these kind of grants and incentives in Europe? No, I, it is. And, and you know, the, the largest rewards will come when you come to project financing. And so, you know, you mentioned that we got 2.4, but we also got the 8 million Canadian we can raise from options and warrants. And when, when you look at process development, uh, you know, that's quite enough. But, you know, as soon as you come to capital expenditure, yeah, then it becomes more relevant because uh, are you going to get uh, uh, state credit guarantees? Are you going to get exported finance? Uh, and, and then even more so down the line when you come to, you know, the project financing, then it becomes very relevant. And uh, you know, it's very, it's a, it's a long-term strategy to be involved in these things. It, it will be, we can fund what we do now, uh, but by also al allocating some time to these efforts, we're sort of already de-risking the financing when we get to the later stage. 
Okay, so let, let's move on to um, the, the heavy rare earths, okay? Rare earths is something that's not, well, it's getting better understood, but it's not, it's not well understood in the market. It's also a small market at the moment, but heavy rare earths, a subset of that. So um, why, why have you gone for heavy rare earths? I know it's a red, you've inherited it, but why is that a, a good project to be focused on? And it's uh, yeah, it's not something we went for. It's something that ended up being there. So yeah. uh, you know, the, the deposit itself is a well-known geological deposit. It was discovered in the early 1900s by a state geologist in Sweden. Uh, looking even back even further, you know, rare, rare earth elements they were discovered in Sweden just 20 minutes away from where I live in the 1700s. So we got a, you know we got a long history of rare earth elements in Sweden. Uh, you know, jumping forward a few hundred years, this deposit was discovered in the 1900s. It was held for by Boliden between the 1950s and the 1990s for uh, for zirconium and for nepheline cyanide, an industrial minerals product. Uh, they left it in 1990 because they didn't have um, efficient enough processing technology to uh, to clean the material enough uh, to sell it as as those applications come our company in 2009 looking for rare earth element deposits this was on free ground and we staked it and you know you can imagine during that environment 2009 to 2011 having a rare earth element project was very easily funded and made rapid progress in drilling that deposit out discovering that there are significant amounts of rare earth elements there uh, but also you know we got much more of the heavy rare earth elements so we got 50 Two percent distribution of the heavies versus the lights, uh, and we're probably the project globally uh, to challenge anyone to demonstrate that can produce uh, more bisprosium or terbium per year than we can do. Uh, bisprosium and terbium being the, the the key additives to the uh, neodymium, iron bore, and magnets. Right, so. Uh, to work at elevated temperatures without demagnetizing, you need dysprosium and terbium. And there's a, there's a balancing problem where the more light rare, uh, light rare earth elements you're going to get online to support magnet production, uh, the less heavy you're going to have. So th they're very key. And you know, uh, point of fact being, you mentioned what, I what is the US doing? You know, they're funding MP materials to develop a heavy rare earth separation plan uh, without MP materials actually having significant feedstock of the heavy rare earth elements. So uh, we see our project, even though it's a rare earth element project, the key benefit of that is the dysprosium and terbium. So dysprosium in our scoping study from last year is 40% of the revenue. That single element. Okay. So again, coming back to the technical nature of, of this, this isn't just about, hey, we've got mines. Right. This is this the this is about vertical integration, and, and you you showed your attitude to how you solve that problem with the graphite. But um, with the with rarest um, element, are you talking to, or will you be talking to partners in terms of how you move this project forward? So the vertical integration in in the space of rare earth elements is uh, is a bit similar to what you have with the graphite. Do you want to sell? You want to have less technical risk and sell a low value product. Uh, the more technical risk you take, the higher value add you get internally. All right. So where we've gone with the rare earth deposit, so it, it's a hard rock deposit, and uh, you know just discovering rare earth elements in the ground that you know, many companies are doing now is, is is the easy bit because they're everywhere, but you know not always in high concentrations. But actually to actually get them concentrated and then to leach them, extract them and then recover them and then to get them to their individual form as separated rare earth element oxides that you know the, it, there's an exponential increase in value add for each step there and then you can go even further with uh, the metallizations of you know, producing the actual metal powders and the alloys of those individual rare earth elements that are then sold to the magnet producers. So I think for us, as a small company, uh, these these type of development stages are significant in terms of the organization and, and, and the capital in, to invest to do that. Uh, we have to limit our focus a bit. We're never going to go into magnet production. Never going to say never say never. But uh, by all logic, not now. Uh, what we've spent you know the 15 years behind us working on this project is on the me metallurgical side. So 
having gone through the process of how do we take our quite unique mineralization. So the mineralogy of the deposit is, is not your standard one. It's a eudelite mineral that is car carrying 90% of the rare earth elements. And it has, in the past, it's had its challenges in terms of the chemical leaching. Uh, luckily there, coming back to the European Union support, we've been part of EU funded projects that have, that have developed a process that works very efficiently on this. And you know, the next step later this year will be to upscale that, uh, you know, it's already been operated on a lab pilot scale level to with very positive numbers on the recovery and the yield for earth elements. We're looking to demonstrate the upscaling of that. And uh, at that point, the subject to those numbers coming out as expected, we have the sort of de-risk technical process for getting out a mixed rare earth oxide concentrate. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's the key for us as a first step. Uh, by doing so, we will significantly de-risk the project, uh, which enables us to look at the separation, uh, which is the uh, right. The and what's that going to cost you? Moving from moving from a lab to some kind of larger scale um, demonstration, whether it be a pilot or, or, or even pre-pilot, what's that going to cost you? What's the time frame there? Because again, you're sitting on another PEA here with an NPV ten of over 750 million bucks, you know, it, it, these, are, these are big projects in relation to your current valuation. So people want a sense of how quickly these, uh, the, the value is released, or, or at least you can point to it. Metallurgical test work, the, the equipment is there. It's um, like, it, it's a chemical leaching reactor that is standing there. It's, uh, it's something that we can fund internally. It, it's something we're not focusing on in the immediate near term. Uh, it's something that we do later this year and comes to uh, what can we do as a company to unlock the value of this project the most? You know, something that I started describing with the graphite mine. For this project, uh, there was a mining lease granted in 2013, got reverted back to an application in 2016. Since then, the perspective from the investor community has been, if you lose the license, you're never going to get it back. Right? So we identified that as a major hurdle and something that, to be honest, probably valued the project at zero because if you have a project that can't get permitted, why ever invest? So we revisited the design of the project based on the input from the concerns from the local community and on the techni technical development work that we've done over the 10 years. What can we do to change the process? So rather than locating all of the facilities, all of the processes at site, so mining, crushing, milling, magnetic separation, more importantly, the chemical leaching, uh, and producing a chemically leached uh, tailings, wet, wet tailings dam. We looked at, you know, does it, it does make more sense to just keep the mining, so essentially keep a mine quarry at site, uh, and then send the mineral concentrate off to a more suitable location for a chemical leaching plant. Uh, so that is, you know, the big change that was presented as part of the scoping study last year. We're now implementing that new design as part of the permit application, which is sitting with the government. Uh, and uh, that should, you know, if people value the project at zero now because they don't believe there's uh, any probability that we'll get the mining lease for a project, if we are successful with demonstrating that we now have a mining lease again, I would say it's not a zero valuation anymore. And I think it's you know, worth remembering that in terms of Peer comparisons are is a terrible tool in in the rare earth element space, okay? Because every project is so complex. But I think you know you you can do a rough peer comparison. There's there's similar projects, you know, uh, similar size, similar grade, similar mineralogy, uh, not as good distribution between the heavies and the lights, and you know having had a longer runway of metallurgical work, having operated pilot plant. So call it. Uh, five, seven year head start to our project. That project is valued at six to 700 million Australian. Whereas our full company is now 40 million Canadian. So that gives some, you know, the upside potential of de-risking the project first through the social license step and then through the metallurgical test. Uh, there's a significant potential uh, unlocking of value through those two steps. Right, and, you know, and then we're starting to talk about rare earth element projects that are in production. You know, that doesn't get valued to a discount to MPV, but gets tech valuations based on 
on, on operating profits. Well, that's the and, and and that's the thing that you, you're going to have to work out and, and unlock and, and communicate to the marketplace. But I'm um, just want just the other thing that's happened recently with with, with the project with with, with the Rares project is that um, well, you announced at the end end of March, but it didn't seem to be much of a reaction, which was the fact that the Court of Appeal had denied leave to appeal against the extension to your um, expiration license. So that was good news, right? For the market. Right. And you know, I think why there was no reaction because people probably value the project at zero. Right? So, you know, if you, if you secure the tenure of your project, but it's still, you know, it's still a zero. Uh, but that's super positive. And it, it shows some of the things that we are fighting, you know, on, on a daily basis, these appeals, but we're successful. You know, we've demonstrated that we can work these things out. But who are you and fighting against? Like, who, who are you fighting against? Are you fighting against government, regional, or, 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 or federal, or, or who was this case with? So it's, uh, it's very much the not in my backyard right. problem. Okay. So if you look on a European Union level, people are supportive of the project. If you look on a national level, parliament is very supportive of projects like ours. Uh, when you come down to the local level, uh, it's, we don't want to mine in our region. Uh, so, you know, th that's where you have a break in the chain of acceptance. And uh, I think now coming with the, uh, so they haven't been able to properly evaluate our new proposal because the material hasn't been submitted to the government for the application purpose. We've told them that there's not going to be a huge tailings dam anymore with chemical leach waste. And, you know, they're asking, but, you know, where's, where, where's the application for that? So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very small mine quarry. You got uh, 1.15 million tons of rock mined uh, per year and a 0 0.3 strip ratio. Uh, 26 years of life of mine gives you an open pit of 800 by 400 meters. Uh, the problem is it's next to one of the biggest lakes in Sweden. Although I want to say it's next to, we have the biggest highway in between, which gives, you know, um, from our perspective, an unfounded fear that is going to make the lake radioactive, for example, because people Google rare earth element mining, they will see the toxic waste lake in China and fear that this is what's going to happen to our lake, which is, has a very nice clear water. So, so, so what, do you, what do you do? I mean, you, you feel it's unfounded and that's great, but that, that doesn't sort, sort anything out. It's you're going to come against these roadblocks unless you do what? What do you need to do? So I, I think in the end, there are people that are, you know, are never going to be convinced and they don't want to be convinced. That's a, that's a very small minority. Uh, we try to engage with them anyway. Uh, in the end, it comes to the governmental agencies to actually judge the application based on, based on its technical merits, right? So if we do that, uh, we should be on. I can't, see, I kind of like these um, groups putting up the occasional challenge to mining companies all around the world and say, can you do this better? And the usual response is from the engineers is, yes, we can. It might cost a little bit more, or maybe it doesn't need to. We'll just rethink it and we'll come back to you. I, I think that's a perfectly reasonable conversation to have, right? Because mining needs to kind of uh, broadly up its game. It needs to up its standards and, uh, and reach. And hence the kind of big, I guess, I guess the, you know, three-letter acronym of the day is ESG at the moment. Um, it'll be called something else in, in five years' time. Um, so I, 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 I don't mind that. So, I mean, again, how much effort do you put into that locally? Well, I mean, if, if I had the time, it's something that you should focus 100% of your time on because it's, you know, it's, 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 the, it's one of the most important things with the project. So I, I do go down and I uh, participate in debate. We write opinion pieces, etc. Uh, but it's, uh, and in the end, it, it'd be nice to have support from the Swedish government, from the European Union, etc., explaining more what mining is about. You know, all mining is not polluting. All mining will not devastate the environment. Uh, there, there's an existing uh, zinc mine uh, operating, you know, next to the lake as well. It's been operating since the 1850s, uh, discharging water to the lake doesn't mean that the lake is polluted. There's been pollution in the past, but you know, as 
requirements have increased and have narrowed and they've uh, you know had to treat the water it's you know it's a very functioning mine and no one would say anything about that mine as it is today yeah no okay i mean i, I guess you're not facing problems that any other com- any other mining companies um don't face as well so um okay. and it, it, it's the same thing as with wind power you know and and i think uh, we have, as a company, we try to do the right thing, right? We've proposed, we've actually addressed some of the major concerns of the project, being chemically leached tailings in wet tailings down there. Uh, you know, we've reduced the land use area by 80% compared with the past design. Uh, we've significantly increased the resource efficiency. So in the past, we got a 0.5% uh, TREO grade. Um, uh, the deposit size is 110 million tons. Uh, in the past, we were only looking to extract the rare earth elements, which gives you 99.5% waste from the mining. Uh, in the new proposal, we take 65% of the material, and it's an industrial minerals product. So the nephilim cyanide, if you remember, that Bo Liden were having the project for originally, we look to commercialize that. So 65% of the, of the waste is now a product. And then we add a few, in terms of tonnage, it's not so significant, but you're Zirconia and uh, niobium pentoxide as well as byproducts, which is quite nice uh, sort of re- revenue contributions. So, I, you know, the point I'm trying to come to by having solved the tailings dam issue by turning waste into product, which is, you know, resource efficiency is one of the cores or pillars of ESG and how you should develop mining projects. You would expect us to get quite a lot of credit for that. But rather than giving credit and seeing it as something is positive, but you're going to have to transport a lot of material now. Yes, because we're not we're not leaving at a site. We're we're next to the highway, so we're going to have trucks going out, in, you know, straight out to the highway, and it's going to go off and it's going to be used, for, you know, for can substitute some of the cement that has a large, uh, uh, you know, carbon footprint, and it's uh, you know it's a much better solution. But you're not always getting credit for that. Okay, um, let, let's very quickly um, just touch upon the uh, R- Romanian uh, nickel cobalt uh, project. You, you're looking at an exploration um, alliance with a JV partner. Um, why, why spread the risk? So I think uh, it's something you know, uh, a legacy asset that that came with the package. Uh, you know, when I came on, and uh, but it, it was a reason for it. You know, uh, in 2016, when uh, realizing what is happening with graphite, seeing the long-term demand, uh, you know, lo- looking what's going to happen with nickel and cobalt, seeing similarities, we started looking around the uh, Scandinavia, Sweden. Uh, couldn't really identify an interesting deposit uh, or any exploration targets there, so we broadened our search a bit. And, you know, obviously ended up uh, as far away as you can get in the European Union from Sweden. But Romania is a European Union company, uh, country and uh, identified uh, an area that's you know very well mineralized. And through some research could see that there is potential for nickel and cobalt mineralization it's quite high grade such uh, in this in this region. So putting together the joint venture with the with the Romanian partner, they they operate the dolomite mine in the near vicinity. So they, they have infrastructure, they have experience um, and know their ways around that region. Um, we put in place a prospecting permit uh, that we worked on for a year. Um, and um, I think this is the key about the project. So even though we call it an exploration project, it's a brownfield exploration project. What does a brownfield exploration project mean? Uh, there's an historic significant uranium mine within our perimeter. Right? So it was, uh, it was mined for decades by the Romanian government. It was closed down in the 90s. Uh, from, as they would do at that time, it was only the uranium that was interesting. Uh, however, everyone knew that there was visible other mineralizations like nickel and cobalt. Uh, and those are the type of sort of, uh, that type of information that we were looking to explore. Uh, so what we've done under the prospecting permit is you know, it's a quite mountainous region with valleys and you have the galleries having been driven into the mountain. Outside of each gallery, you have grab samples from within the mountain. So we've sampled those and uh, assayed them. And from the results of that, yeah, it's clear, clear indications that, are, uh, that there is nickel and cobalt in there. The question then becomes how much? Uh, and that's what we're looking to do now with the exploration license. So having concluded the prospecting permit work in 2019, it's taken some time. Uh, 
we applied for an exclusive exploration license. So prospecting permit, not exclusive, exploration license exclusive. And uh, we applied for that. Uh, there was some appeal against the process that we were not a part to, which delayed uh, the valuation of the exploration bids. Uh, then came COVID. So, you know, we're now in 2022, three years later, people ask me, why did you go to Romania suddenly? I said, yeah, we didn't go there suddenly. We've been waiting for this for three years. Uh, so we now fi finally have the exploration license, which means also as part of the exploration, exploration license bid, we put together an exploration program over five years. Uh, we're committed to the first year and, and we're looking to launch that immediately now. Um, Okay. Well, look, um, Philippe, I'm just kind of conscious of time. I want to be um, respectful of, of other people's time too. So um, maybe we can come, if you happy to come back on, maybe we can, you know, dive deep into some of those topics discussed today. But so broadly, there you go. You kind of, you've laid out the stool. Um, you're, well, it, 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 you're in the right commodities, it, it seems, for, for the market. Um, and I like the idea. And, and uh, when, so just remind me again, in terms of the, the warrants, when, when would that, when would they start coming through? So 24 and 25, uh, right. 10, 10 and 20 cent warrants. Uh, so, what, so what about between now and then in terms of any type, kind of top up, need for top up to kind of keep the, the, the plan on the road? I think that's a key key message that you know things always change, but as a company, you know what's the uh, how do we most efficiently fund uh, the company uh, for what we need to do? And uh, if as long as we see the company significantly undervalued, and what do we mean by significant undervalued? So take our graphite project, do a peer peer comparison on that graphite project against other listed companies that only have a graphite project. Uh, you know, based on the numbers, we're undervalued. Same thing with the rare earth element project. Uh, an exploration project, you know, very hard to put the value on it, but at least we have that upside. So uh, as long as we're undervalued compared with our peers, rather than bringing in new external investors, I think there's a perspective from the company that is more efficiently to use the, the instruments that we have at hand. But it's, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a constant discussion. How do you more, most efficiently fund the company? I think for, for the development work that we want to do now to, you know, we've, we've, since we started, we've de-risked the company from a 5 million US market cap to a now 30 million US market cap. Uh, you know, what's the next step us, for us in terms of unlocking value where we, where we suddenly come on a more level, uh, on a more of a level field with the, with our peers, then we can start to look more actively in, you know, where do we bring in the funds from? 